2012 is the year of elections. By the end of this year, nearly 60 countries would have gone to the polls, either local or national, impacting about a third of the world's population. Among the countries that could see changes in leadership are four of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. Russia and France have already chosen new leaders. China and the United States could follow. Former Sri Lankan Ambassador to the United States, Devendra Subasinghe, joins us to talk about some of the key elections this year and their impact on global trends. All that and more on this week's Global Perspectives. Good evening and welcome to Global Perspectives. It is quite rare that the leadership positions in so many countries are up for grabs in a single year. But whether it's local or national, all these elections, mainly in the powerful countries, will set the stage for two of the biggest global issues, the economy and human rights. In our first report, we start by taking a look back at some of the major elections that have already taken place in 2012. Russia and France had a change in leadership already, and Egypt and Myanmar marked some much-awaited positive political change with elections that took place earlier this year as well. Russia was the first major election to take place in 2012, with little doubt about who would be the country's next leader. It almost looked like a friendly exchange of titles between the president and prime minister. Dmitry Medvedev became the new prime minister, while Vladimir Putin once again reclaimed the top job for a record third term. Even though anti-Putin protests and low approval ratings had some experts speculating about a tough race, it seemed that Putin and Medvedev were able to successfully orchestrate a campaign that assured both men would remain in leadership positions. What this result means for Russia's future is a bit difficult to tell this early on, according to Ambassador Devendra Supersinger, who sees Russia moving towards a more nationalistic agenda. Now, it, Russia had an interesting situation where it was almost like no transition happened. Uh, uh, Putin had continued to be the leader of the nation. And how is Russia going to fare? Is it going to be more of the same? Or does Putin and his administration are sh showing signs of different foreign policy, different economic policies, and so on and so forth? I think uh, time will tell. It's hard to say in this immediate aftermath, if you look at what's happened in the last couple of weeks, uh, President Putin declined to go to the NATO summit in, uh, in Chicago, for example, saying and sending Prime Minister Medvedev to that summit. Does that mean that there's a chilling of that relationship between the two uh, Cold War any, uh, rivals, or what does this mean? I think clearly, uh, as China is looking and speaking out more on liberalization, I believe in Moscow you're probably going to hear more of a nationalistic, uh, strong defense, uh, strong uh, stand, uh, stand up type policy that Putin has always stood for. That having been said, uh, Russia is a country full of resources and opportunities in the energy sector and, and other key sectors. And they will have to uh, start mobilizing capital into those sectors and having much more transparent, more competitive economy in order for them to go to the next level of economic development. So it will be interesting to see how Putin balances his stronger international stance with, uh, with uh, growing the economy domestically. Putin declined the invitation to attend the G8 summit that U.S. President Barack Obama hosted at Camp David in May. He sent Medvedev instead. Some analysts saw the decision as the result of increasing tensions between Russia and the United States. Putin had called Obama to say he was just too busy forming his new government, but a few weeks later, Putin made his first official visit abroad after receiving office. The trip was to China. First indications of the direction of Russia's new leadership may be that the country is leading more towards the east than the west. Unlike in Russia, where the leadership stayed more or less the same, in France there was a pretty dramatic change at the top. In elections held in early May, the French voted into power the first left-wing president in more than 15 years. During his campaign, outgoing president Nicolas Sarkozy had promised to quit politics if he lost the elections, becoming only the second president to lose a re-election bid. While the election results may have seemed like a surprise to outsiders, to the French and others who monitor French politics closely, they said there were clear indications that outgoing President Sarkozy would not win re-election. At the same time, however, the election couldn't be called a landslide victory. New French President Francois Hollande won with a 51.6% of the vote to Sarkozy's 48.4%. And it's definitely going to be interesting times for Russia, but we know very recently it's been interesting times for France. Uh, there was, was the election a surprise uh, from your understanding and your speculation? Did you expect the current leader to appear as, uh, it was a close election for the most part, but was it a surprise and also what 
made this whole for France, especially with so many uh, fiscal decisions to be made of trying to be more conservative in their spending, but the population not very happy with the amount of uh, taxes and all of that coming on board. How is this going to affect France? I think it was hard to predict. Uh, it was a meltdown of, the, of President Sarkozy's uh, support and uh, his campaign in the last few weeks of the campaign uh, and current President Hollande's election I think in the last weeks was fairly obvious the handwriting was on the wall public opinion polling is showing that he was uh, increasingly getting ahead of um, uh, President Sarkozy I think there the issue is uh, you know uh, Europe is in crisis uh, not just uh, Portugal Ireland Greece uh, and Spain Greece uh, you know really not making it uh, forward at all and the debate about do you stimulate the economy or do you uh, uh, put the brakes on it and make huge cuts that have social implications in the health sector, retirement uh, and so on. And I think that debate, the growth, uh, the kind of stimulating growth versus uh, uh, austerity, I think is what uh, won the day where Olan was talking about increasing government spending and uh, that you can't go on tightening the belt indefinitely that you have to make some compensating uh, interventions by the government to stimulate the economy. Sarkozy's inability to address the high unemployment rate and bring in more growth have been the biggest factors in his loss. This year's election was primarily a choice between fundamentally liberal and conservative approaches to economic problems. And this shift in power and ideology is sure to have a big impact on the direction of the euro. France is Europe's second largest economy, a crucial partner to Berlin and a big player in the debt crisis. But these austerity measures seem to be like the prevailing question all across Europe. And, uh, but both sides of the argument seem to have a lot of credit in the sense of they, they both have a very strong point. However, it's going to one extreme or the other. Do you think Sarkozy was pushing the line too much and towards the end his opposition was able to capitalize on that? Or do you just think that's the reaction from the people because of the difficulties they're going through and will that be the case in the rest of Europe as it shows to be? I think clearly as we saw Angela Merkel and uh, President Sarkozy saw eye to eye with uh, Chancellor Merkel offering to even campaign for Sarkozy which he didn't do. Uh, I think there was a kind of meeting of minds on the debate about uh, austerity versus uh, stimulus. Uh, the Germans taking the very hard line view, look we got here because we had a, a, a tight, tough monetary policy and, and tightened up on government spending. Whereas uh, Sarkozy couldn't have gone that far uh, and I think there was genuine concern among the French voters about their social security system, uh, the very comfortable uh, kind of labor system that they have and so on that they might have to literally restructure the social compact that they have uh, with the people. But I think that seeing, uh, trying to uh, tag very closely with uh, Chancellor Merkel on, on the issue of uh, austerity I think probably tipped the balance in the other direction against Sarkozy. In Europe, the economy has by far been the issue with the most impact on power transitions. Sarkozy is now another leader among about half a dozen others in Eurozone countries to be defeated in elections since the debt crisis of the past three years. Egypt's much-awaited election is being called historic since it was the first since the 2011 uprising that overthrew long-term leader Hosni Mubarak. It is the first time in a very long time that the Egyptian people may really have a say in who the country's next leader will be. With a number of candidates and no clear leader, the first round of elections was not enough to pick a clear winner. So two candidates will battle it out in a runoff vote. Mohamed Mursi, the candidate from the Muslim Brotherhood, will compete with Ahmed Shafiq, the country's last prime minister. Isabel Coleman, an analyst from the Council on Foreign Relations, says Egypt's next leader will have an important role to play. Whoever is elected is going to have a very um, important role in shaping the future of the country. You've got um, uh, the, the role of writing the constitution that will, um, because the, the role of the president is currently undefined. And so whoever is elected is going to have uh, to juggle between the, the parliament and, uh, and the military that has uh, still a considerable amount of control in the country and manage that process of, of writing a new constitution and laying out um, the direction for Egypt's future. And that future looks like it will be marred with violence, at least in the short term. Even though the former dictator was deposed with the hope of ending violence, the streets of Cairo are still not peaceful. The new leader, whoever it is, will not only have the burden of maintaining democracy, but making sure that the chaos of last year doesn't repeat itself.
One of the most anticipated elections took place in the Southeast Asian country of Myanmar, where opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi was able to contest and win elections after years of house arrest. Even though the election was only to select a fraction of parliamentary seats, it was viewed as a significant shift from the military rule that had a tradition of suppressing opposition voices. I think, however, that this was quite symbolically important. This was a key signpost, I think, that the new government actually is moving in direction of reform. But certainly there is still a long way to go yet. Myanmar has, up until recently, been a largely isolated country that is one of the poorest in the world. Why then are so many countries, including the Western powers, so keenly watching developments in Myanmar? Analysts say there are several factors. The country does have its share of natural resources, timber and natural gas are a couple of examples. Japan is already eyeing Myanmar as a centre for cheap manufacturing, but perhaps most important is its strategic geographic location positioned right in between rising Asian superpowers, China and India. When we come back, we look to the future and the two most important political shifts that could happen in 2012, China and the United States. Stay with us, you're watching Global Perspectives.